Hello there. If you want more excitement in your chess, then you've come to the right place. Few would argue that the snazzy Sicilian Dragon is not the most exhilarating opening. And well, those that do are wrong. In 1993, I wrote this stunning masterpiece based partly on my lifetime's experiences. This epic 1995 video of Dances with Wolves proportions depicts some of these thrills and spills in conjunction with the new stuff. I'm here to guide you through the dragon's choppy waters. Hold on to your seats, you're in for the ride of your life. White launches into the open Sicilian with d4 and the Sicilian dragon is initiated by the move g6. Note, the piece most characterising this opening is the both offensive and defensive dragon bishop which soon materialises on g7. I'm going to split white's options up as follows. First of all we have the real acid test, the Yugoslav attack, and then the trappy levenfish. The classical variations follow this, after which we have all of those lines with g3, the lines in which white fianchettos his king's bishop. Finally, we have the trendy six bishop c4, in which white intends kingside castling. The Yugoslav attack is without a doubt the most dangerous attempt by white at refuting the Sicilian dragon. Here the bishop moves to e3. Now this bishop is a very very key piece. If white ever wishes to neutralise the dragon bishop which will materialise on g7 then this piece, the bishop again on e3, is the piece most likely to do so. For this reason it's always good for black to keep an eye out on exchanging this bishop off. A move like knight g4 often comes in handy, although here it would be a disaster. White could continue with bishop to b5 check. Now, obviously the knight can't move itself to c6 due to the knight on d4, and if simply bishop d7, then the white queen can capture the g4 knight free of charge. Black continues with the natural bishop to g7, and now pawn to f3. This move characterising the Yugoslav attack. Now why does white play this move? The first and obvious reason is that it prevents knight to g4. A lot of players actually forget about this. Secondly, white not only supports the e4 pawn, but prepares a, a pawn, pawn storm for later on in the game, perhaps g2 to g4. Hence, black castles. White continues with the plan of queenside castling, queen to d2, and black knight to c6. The moves knight c6 and castles can be interchanged. To be honest, there's no real difference. Black has now made all of the usual Sicilian dragon moves and is preparing a central pawn break d5. This move looks a little unusual, bearing in mind black did play it to d6 in the first place. However, it seeks to expose white's centrally posted pieces. White, of course, would like to simply advance the pawn to e5. But, of course, the black knight on c6 puts a stop to that. OK, time now to run over some of the main ideas and themes running through the Sicilian can, certainly at the outset. And we'll just take you through the basic moves, where white plays knight takes d4 and uh, black plays a6. The main virtue of black's opening play is the elasticity of the, the black position. Black doesn't commit himself to any particular configuration or piece placement. There are several ways that black can develop his pieces. Um, the hallmark of the Sicilian can is adaptability. Basically black is adapting to what white is doing and he's keeping as elastic a position as he can whilst he does so. For instance, white's main moves in this position are, in order, knight c3, 
bishop d3 and finally c4 and black has different ways of adapting to each against c4 I'm going to recommend that black continue with the flexible knight f6 and then queen c7 in particular here black is retaining options with his d-pawn and he's keeping the diagonal of the king's bishop open these are major trumps in black's hand black may play d6 or d5 in one go he may play his bishop to uh, e7 he may play it to b4 it depends what white is doing at any rate this is the most flexible way for black to proceed going back to the position after a6 after knight c3 I'm going to recommend black proceed with the very aggressive move b5 uh, this is an option black doesn't normally have in the Sicilian at this early stage and it's an option which I think will um, intimidate a lot of white players going back to a6 after bishop d3 I'm going to recommend that black's play, black plays the flexible move g6 it's very important here that um, black keeps these options open with his d-pawn because we're going to see games where black plays d6 we're going to see games where black plays an early d5 at any rate here the main idea initially is station the king's bishop actively on the long diagonal to play knight e7 and then to think about the move d5 although we'll see other games where black does knight f6 and d6 so flexibility is the watchword as we begin our investigation okay basically the typical Sicilian cam position is reached after the following moves white plays e4 c5 knight f3 e d4 c takes d4 knight takes d4 and now the elastic move a6 and um, I think this is a very good weapon for club players to adopt basically because it's played rarely at that level among um, lesser players everybody concentrates on the Nidorf, the dragon the Shveshnikov and in the rush to play these highly theorized openings you know the can is forgotten and it's a perfectly reasonable way for black to play as we will see it's my perception that the average club player doesn't really have um, anything theoretical to show against this line simply because they encounter it infrequently you know they're ready for the other lines but um, but, but not this one and uh, essentially a6 is a, a kind of very positive waiting move you know black is cutting white out of b5 he's preparing the move b5 himself he doesn't commit himself to any particular piece placements or pawn configurations so it's as in, an elastic as a move as, as you can find here and usually you know 99 times out of 100 white is going to respond with one of three moves we're going to take a look at knight c3 uh, first which I believe will be the most common move for the average player to have to face then the move which is played most at grandmaster level bishop to d3 we're going to have to obviously have a very close look at that and we'll finish off with um, a glance at the move c4 which um, if there is a drawback to this particular move order from black's point of view it has to be that white is able to play a Maroxy bind setup with with c4 and um, you're going to have to know how to handle those types of pawn structure when you play the camp where white you know delays the development of the knight to c3 and plays c4 instead that can crop up in the bishop d3 line as well but first of all let's tackle the most straightforward move knight to c3 and against that I'm going to recommend the very aggressive reply b5 this is black's most ambitious attempt in this particular position Black's intending to station his bishop on b7 as early as possible and put pressure on white's pawn at e4. That is the basic strategical idea and tactical idea in this position. Among modern grandmasters, the name of Peter Svidler stands out as a regular exponent of this line. And I believe this line will furnish very good results amongst average players who simply don't like as white the thought that the initiative is going to be taken away from them right at the start of the game which is exactly what this ambitious move b5 strives to do there are plenty of other moves for black um, in the position after knight c3 but b5 is straightforward and um, aggressive and this is exactly what club players need and the first game we're going to look at is a game between international master Duckstein from Austria and uh, grandmaster Bent Larsen this game was played in 1959 Hello, I'm International Master Andrew Martin and I'd like to welcome you to this Foxy Openings DVD on the Sveshnikov. 
The Sveshnikov Sicilian is one of the sharpest openings that black can play. But I hope to demonstrate by showing you the main themes and ideas and some interesting games using this opening that in fact the Sveshnikov can be learned and used successfully in your own games with a minimum of theoretical knowledge. It's the ideal opening for the club player. Black attacks right from the word go and I think it will furnish you with good results. Without further ado then, on with the show. Well one of the main attractions of the Sveshnikov variation is the fact that black usually gets an active game. What does this mean though? How does it translate itself into practice? Well let's take a look at the game Buczynskas versus Ivanchuk which comes from the European Cup which was played in Fugen in 2006 to try to illustrate this point. And the first interesting point to note is that Ivanchuk goes into the Sveshnikov via the Four Knights Sicilian move order. Now the idea of playing this way as black is to avoid the variation with 7 knight d5. For instance if I go back to knight f6 let me just show you exactly what I mean. If, white, if black plays the traditional move order with both knights coming out and then e5, white can play in this position knight d5. Now I'll show later on on the DVD, this is not to be feared, but um, the point of Ivanchuk's move order, and we're going to go back to the game now, is to avoid this setup altogether. Of course, when you play the four knights, um, there are other lines to consider. For instance, there's no need for white to play knight db5 as Buczynskas does here. White can consider moves like uh, knight takes c6. That's one dangerous variation, although I dare say Ivanchuk was uh, very well prepared to meet that. And there are other moves too, like the simple bishop e2. Um, lines which take us away from our desired Sveshnikov position. So I'm not going to recommend this move order, although it is perfectly viable for black and um, represents a pretty decent way to play. Now in the game of course white is threatening knight d6 check. Um, black can play bishop b4 in that position but um, that's got a slightly dubious reputation. So what we get in effect here is transposition back into a Sveshnikov with bishop f4 forcing black's hand because of the, uh, the pressure on uh, d6. So black has to play e5 and now we get back into a Sveshnikov which I dare say was to both players liking. And now here's the traditional jab, a6, well timed because um, white was threatening knight d5 in that position, pushing the knight back to a3, giving black time to play b5, and now battle is joined. Black is threatening uh, b4 in this position, winning a knight, and therefore white's got a basic choice here. He either takes on f6 straight away or he plays knight d5, and in either case, I'm going to show that black gets pretty decent active chances. Well, at least a lot of the world player, world top players think so because um, this position appears regularly in their games. Well, this is very much a question of taste. Um, bishop takes f6 is a move which damages black's structure. It's actually unfavourable for black to take with the queen in this position. Although, funnily enough, Sveshnikov did do this in the early days because of the simple move knight d5 and after queen d8, white has c4. Okay, we need not concern ourselves with this variation um, because we're not going to play it. So g takes f6 will be our move. Just going back to the position after b5, the other main line is of course knight d5. And then I'm going to recommend bishop e7 and white can play bishop takes f6 if he wants to. And then a more positional game ensues, a quieter game where black's pawn structure isn't damaged but white gets um, a rather free hand initially and black's got to be a bit careful how he opens up the game for his, uh, for his bishop pair in this position. So um, it really is a question of taste and on that day Buczynskas, sorry these names are a little bit um, impenetrable, takes on f6 and eventually takes back with the g pawn. And now white puts his knight in on that d5 square. Right, what are the main trumps in black's position? Well, I think it's fairly obvious that the first main trump is black's bishop pair. This is a, a key element in the position, and in particular the dark square bishop. That's the piece white doesn't have, so black is looking to liberate that bishop at the earliest possible opportunity. Certainly black does not want that bishop the whole game through, sitting, looking at the pawn on d6. 
So it's really a question of how he actually liberates that bishop. Now the black pawns can't stay as they are for very long and so black's looking to play f5. This is a key move in the whole black setup uh, and helps to liberate the bishop if we think about the, the dark square bishop coming to g7. Certainly black's pawn mass in the centre is a very dynamic aspect of the position. Black all the time is looking to liberate that pawn mass with the help of moves such as f5, f takes e4 and again a second move f5. So white has got to be very accurate in this position to avoid being swept away by black's activity. But again black has two choices on this DVD I'm going to recommend bishop g7 to you which is the novel Sibirsk variation. It's a fairly modern way to approach the position. It looks ridiculous at first sight because uh, the bishop goes to a square where it's simply looking at a pawn. But black, black's pawn is not going to stay on f6 for very long I assure you. This line has the benefit of avoiding certain sharp variations which f5, the other move, encourages. Um, this is also a decent move, uh, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just that I think bishop g7 at lower levels will be a move that your opponents are less prepared to meet and is no less dangerous than f5 and requires a Hello, I'm International Master Andrew Martin and I'd like to welcome you to this Foxy Openings DVD on the Sveshnikov. The Sveshnikov Sicilian is one of the sharpest openings that black can play. But I hope to demonstrate by showing you the main themes and ideas and some interesting games using this opening that in fact the Sveshnikov can be learned and used successfully in your own games with a minimum of theoretical knowledge. It's the ideal opening for the club player. Black attacks right from the word go and I think it will furnish you with good results. Without further ado then, on with the show. To conclude our survey of um, White's seventh moves that are worth any salt whatsoever, we uh, take a look at the move A4, which is an old move dating from Lasker's days. It's played sporadically um, at Grandmaster level um, in the modern era. We're going to look at a game De Fermian versus Vallejo Ponce, two very strong grandmasters. This game was played in a Norwegian tournament in 2003, and it will show you a very. Guys, this is Grandmaster Timur Gareev, and today we're going to be examining the dragon variation of this. approaches to dragon, which were used at the very beginning, uh, at the very origin of the variation. So we're going to take a look at uh, two games by. Uh, Simagin with interesting sacrifices and uh, amazing uh, tactical complexities. Then we're going to go ahead and take a look at Karpov Karchnoi, a legendary game where uh, Karpov executed uh, the attack flawlessly. Um, this game would indicate for us what are the dangers for black to be uh, playing dragon variation and what kind of opportunities uh, there exists for white that black has to uh, face and counter. And then uh, finally we're gonna get to the competitive side of dragon variation, uh, taking a look at uh, the modern giants of uh, dragon variation, Carlson, Rajabov and Karekin matching each other. So here uh, move number two, black goes for d6, you guys I'm sure familiar with this uh, Sicilian setup and uh, here if black wants to go for accelerated dragon uh, here she would pick g6 and after d4 c takes d knight d4 and knight c6 uh, white has several options including marotte bind system so here and as well as queen d4 okay so for uh, for you guys out there who want to play the main line or the more aggressive more challenging line of dragon uh, starting with d6 you would pick this particular move order where white goes ahead and plays d4 c takes d knight d4 knight f6 knight c3 defending the pawn on e4 very natural development and here black goes ahead and plays g6 bishop e3 now 
The idea of bishop e3 is to, well, number one, develop the piece. It's uh, put it on a good spot, and you may ask why not play knight g4, challenging uh, the bishop right there. And turns out it's it's a bad move, which almost loses the game. After bishop b5, bishop d7, queen takes g4, and black is down a piece. Now, uh, if black counters the knight c6, knight c6, b takes c, uh, he loses uh, an exchange right there on a8. So, so black is not ready for knight g4, black goes bishop g7, and here uh, white really wants to play queen d2 and potentially uh, get the bishop to h6 and continue on the attack via h4, h5, white goes ahead and plays queen d2 black is going to continue knight g4 now white really wants to remove that bishop because if black is going to capture the bishop let's say after uh, white castles then this bishop right here on g7 is, is going to have no opponent no one to stop this bishop from dominating this diagonal and creating a powerful or assisting in creating a powerful attack so here uh, let's say uh, after knight g4 white goes ahead and continues bishop b5 making a check well this doesn't really help quite as much bishop d7 now let's say white prefers to remove the bishop bishop f4 is going to run into e5 so bishop g5 and after h6, bishop h4, knight c6. Uh, black is going to be putting a lot of pressure right here. And if bishop or knight captures that knight on c6, pawn is going to take, and uh, black is additionally going to gain this file for attack. So here, this is not favorable way for white to play and the main line goes ahead and secures this square on welcome to our new dvd series on the dragon i'm grandmaster ronan hartley together with my friend timo garay grandmaster how are you timo hello and before let me a little bit introduce timo we, we just made it to the top 100 in the world, and congratulations on that. The winner of Chicago Open 2011, the National Open 2010, the first one to do it in 26 years, or alone, or something like that. So definitely is the stronger of that side, but I will do my best to keep you entertained and look at the lines together with Timmy. So, um, hello guys, uh, Ronan Hart is going to be our host, and... Uh the one who's going to guide the interaction. Uh, he is uh, an experienced coach. He became world champion under 16 back a few years ago, just a couple of years ago. Too many. Yeah, too many. And uh, uh, since then, he focused in, in his early 20s, he got to focus on teaching and producing instructional materials. So that's what we're going to be doing for you guys today. And the topic is uh, Sicilian Dragon. And the position that you see on the board right now is already maybe the critical position after move 9, long castle. Another DVD will cover move 9, bishop c4. Let's get back to the first move and quickly see how we can get into this position and then discuss a little bit the opening itself. e4, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, capture, capture, knight f6, knight c3, g6, bishop e3, bishop g7, dragon, the Yugoslav variation. And this critical position, the heart of the dragon, has two main moves. Long castle, which will be the topic for this DVD, and bishop c4, which is going to be the topic for our next DVD. What is the main difference between those two moves, the way that you see it, Timo? Well, uh, so there's the castle and there's the bishop c4. So obviously putting the 
bishop on c4 adds to this to the power the, the bishop would be striking from b3 actually because oftentimes it adjusts and after a prophylaxis it stays there uh, for a few moves in certain spots it gets exchanged but uh, this is the, the the key idea would be to put pressure along this diagonal and combine it with the attack on the king side where two of those become extremely strong the idea of castle the move they're going to be focusing on is to start the attack as soon as possible so the logical conclusion to this situation should be that black gotta go for d5 in this position that's the line we're going to be focusing on not only going to d5 do something and something quick in the center just a general uh, comment if we go back a move and look at the lines with bishop c4 like you mentioned Timo after bishop c4 bishop going to b3 many times black plays knight to e5 or a5 followed by rook c8 the knight goes to c4 either way and white will capture it but if the bishop stays on f1 the bishop is still attacking c4 only that White is not wasting two moves, bishop c4, b3, then capturing, which means black cannot, absolutely cannot stick to the normal plans, bishop d7, rook c8. He will just be killed on the king side. Therefore, after castle, we either see plans such as knight take d4, bishop take d4, and bishop e6, which is one major alternative to d5. Some other sidelines that well we consider really sidelines, and obviously the main one, by far the main one, which is d5, playing in the center immediately. So d5 is the classic breakthrough in the center. White uh, faces uh, a decision here, and uh, for people who are familiar with the theory, uh, the decision becomes critical with the options of he takes the knight d5, knight c6, b takes c, the classical line following knight d5, accepting the pawn sacrifice, the modern line, bishop d4. Hey again, we are number 9 long castle, which is a very interesting variation and now we are heading into absolutely the main Yugoslav variation against the dragon bishop c4 and which line are we going to put most of our attention Timo? So we're gonna focus on uh, the uh, latest uh, version of dragon that is most competitive uh, on the highest level uh, Chinese dragon Chinese variation uh, and the ideas of Bishop d7, knight a5, rook b8, uh, and the potential b5, b4. And also an interesting uh, idea of e5, they're going to be uh, seeing a lot. So maybe at this point it may sound just a little bit confusing, but I'll wait just a, a couple moments and we'll introduce you to the ideas. An exact move order, move order is going to be quite important. It's going to be, the position is going to be very similar, the idea is going to be similar, but the move order is going to be essential for us to to get the opening edge. Right. I mean, e5 right now looks very, very bizarre, but it does happen after the knight exchanges for the bishop on b3, and then the, the light squares are a bit more secured, so black actually can go and play e5. We will just mention that there is nothing wrong with the main variation, right? Uh, by, by no means we are rejecting it or suggesting not to play it at all. It's just that there is so much theory to study and look in this position. Start, starting from the move king to b1, h4, the old line, h5, bishop, g5, rook c5 with g4, f4, just endless amount really of really crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. stuff. And we, we can probably fill easily 10 hours, uh, five, five DVDs each one, two hours, and wouldn't touch enough. Bishop h6 immediately is a decent enough move. 
I think that one of the reasons why Rook B8 became that popular is because it is, amazingly enough, a more solid approach. We will see that there are not so many checkmates attack here, a lot more positional play. Exactly, there's more play, more ideas, it's not as, as forced. And you don't have to memorize as much. Exactly, and you know we have some of the players like Carlsen, Rajabov that's playing it, Rajabov, Carlsen, Karyakin with white pieces and many other super strong players with the uh, black pieces, Mutilev and we have, you know, just Carlsen and Rajabov, the fact they play it is enough for everyone to consider playing this line. So let, let's go to move 9, bishop c4 and see how we get into our critical position. Bishop d7 and here bishop b3 is indeed the main move castle and here after bishop d7 either bishop to b3 is possible or long castle there is just one line that we would like to mention is that if long castle which is uh, the main move because bishop to b3 sometimes give possibilities to take on d4 and immediately push b5 black should play here the move rook b8 Okay, we are going back to see bishop b3 with sometimes it gives those possi immediate possibilities for black. But if we are to look at long castle, then the move that black should be looking at is mainly rook b8 with the idea of take and b5 transposed to the same position. The move knight a5, uh, there is one important game that will be our model game for understanding why knight a5 immediately is not that great. It's a game played by Anand, always a nice example to start with, playing against Kirill Georgiev, which we mentioned in the Long Castle. We mentioned his name several times, one of the biggest dragon experts in the world in the last 20 years. The main difference is that when the bishop is not yet on b3, white is going to play bishop e2. And let's take a minute and figure out why, why we like this move. If rook b8 and b5, well, that square is under control by white. Black can always go, well, I wouldn't even say berserk, always give that pawn away, but it's not that much if it doesn't have a really follow-up, and in this position it doesn't. So the bishop goes to e2, kind of take away the b5 idea. Now, what happens if the, bishop, if the rook goes to c8? Well, let's see how white played. King b1. Now, what happens if black plays knight c4? Basically, we are transposing. Take a picture of this position for a second. Let me go back and show you the main variation. So the main variation will go, let's say, castle. Rook to c8. Bishop to b3. Knight e5. King b1. It became actually quite one of the main lines. And here the two absolute main moves for black are a6 and rook e8. We have many, many of the elite players in the world playing it. So the idea of rook e8 is essentially the, the, key, the key idea of the opening is to play bishop h6. So uh, black would uh, do a little prophylaxis, rook e8, so that uh, bishop h6, obviously bishop h8, saving the bishop. Uh, without having to exchange it or sacrifice the rook which happens sometimes uh, after bishop h6 sometimes black despite the fact that the rook is hanging would retreat the rook exactly but in such early stage black wouldn't like to give the exchange for free at, er at much later stages very easily exactly. the rook is being given but in this position knight c4 is not really the way to continue not considered at least that great Cat Capture, capture, and here moves like g4 with some ideas, knight d2. I mean, those are considered, there were some model games played in this line, and they are just considered in white's favor. Black doesn't follow that anymore. Like uh, Karpov Karchno. Exactly. That's really classic. Uh, from 74. Example, yeah. I was just waiting for you to mention that. That's one of the greatest games in this line from what became basically the World Championship match since. Fischer never showed up to 75, and this was the final of the candidate matches. Very, very narrow margin, 12 and a half, 11 and a half for Karpov. So, let's go back and now see our moves. 
move over. Hi, I'm here to introduce to you the delights of the anti-Sicilian. If you like, this is a sort of anti-anti-Sicilian video. I can only hope that an anti-anti-anti-Sicilian one never comes to fruition. These quite timid variations are becoming more popular as a way of frustrating the likes of Sicilian dragon players, myself included, who are more accustomed to nail-biting encounters involving do-or-die attacks. The problem is that this rather tedious tactic is only too frequently succeeding. The long and short of it is that these lines must now be taken seriously. The systems I'm about to recommend for black are generally my own favourites, and those that aren't, I will soon be adopting. They are simple and hopefully effective antidotes. The Sicilian C3, or the Alapin Shveshnikov variation, is the mother of all anti Sicilians. The stigma attached to it as being dull and rather boring, in my view, still stands, although it has become more socially acceptable since being adopted by the likes of world champion or ex world champion Anatoly Karpov. White prepares to get a strong pawn centre with d4, c takes d4 and c takes d4. This is something which black cannot really allow. I'm suggesting that black takes advantage of the fact that the white knight can't come to the c3 square here by playing d5 